Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we are celebrating the release of Cubase 14. It's fresh out of the oven, haven't been released just 10 seconds ago. In this video, I'm taking a broad stroke approach to highlight some of the exciting new features and giving you a sense of what's new rather than an in-depth breakdown of each one. And as always, if you find this content valuable, please like, subscribe and hit the bell to stay updated on future videos. Now let's dive in and see what Cubase 14 brings to the plate. Underlay! So first things first, look at the UI. It looks much clearer and much sharper and I like the black edges of the screen. If I compare it to Cubase 13, this is what we used to have. And the overall feel is that the graphics is much better rendered. And uh, it's due to the fact that now Cubase supports 4K and 8K resolution, resulting in better efficiency, color conversion, and performance. So the overall look and feel is much, much slicker. Now let's go into the more musical side of things. We now have a new track called the Drum Track, which is a combination of a drum machine and a pattern event, which looks like this. This is the new drum machine, which offer four layers with a built-in drum synthesizer ranging from 808, 909, Simmons drum machine, and an FM synthesizer, which sounds out of the box, absolutely gorgeous. You can load track presets right from this section here, and it's a track preset, meaning that if you set up additional stuff, you know, in your channel, like EQ or insert effects and whatever, all of this is packed into this track presets along with the drum machine. So now let's select a preset and play around a bit. We can hear a lot of samples in this one. You see combinations of samples and some of them contain synthesizers. Let's take a preset that it's totally synthesized. I think the beat starter one is basically, yeah, the drum synthesizer. I will turn out this button so it follows the pads themselves. Yeah, it's a classical 808 all the way through. And it's all synthesized. Meaning that if I take the drum, I can control every aspect of the drum synthesis itself, which give you a lot of control and a synthesis lesson. Here's the general tone and pitch of the kick, adding or removing the click. Let's put on a pitch envelope for more oomph and more punch and lengthen it up, and lower it down. Perfect 808 with distortion and amplifier section and whatnot. So you can choose from all of these different models. Kick have four versions, snare have four, six versions. I had toms, claps, cymbals, percussion, and of course samples, and you can layer them up in four slots and have each one of them in different levels and so on. So if I go back to one of these pads, let's say I wanna add a layer to this kick. I will choose this slot and just drag a sample from the media bay. And while we at the media bay. If I choose a sample now from the media bay, notice the bottom section. You see how it looks like? You see the library it's coming from, the BPM. You can also turn on, match the tempo, half tempo, double tempo, or freely scrub around to change the pitch and tempo. It's a tape algorithm. So you can get a better feel of what you're going to get if you drag it into the project in a different pitch and tempo. And if I go back here, you can also match it, of course, to the global transpose, if you use that feature and transpose it by semitones, define the root note, if there's one available. So that's a very nice touch added to the media bay. But going back to the samples, let's say I want a kick sample. So I will just manually look for a kick for a second. And let's say we want a one shot. So here's another kick and I'm dragging it to layer number two. Now we have a sample and a synthesizer playing at the same time. Now, if I'm using samples, here's another cool thing you can do. Let's take this one. This kick is tagged. 
with a certain tagging. So if I right click this pad that contains this sample and click find samples, find instruments, by the way, looks for the synthesized presets. I want the raw audio samples. So the search now looking for the same sort of tagged material, which is a very nice touch. So that's about the sample dragging and you can have, again, up to four layers and you have all of this audio options here. It's important to say that we have built-in effects for each and every one of the pads. We can have up to four effects, which starts with a bit crusher, will immediately truncate your signal to eight bits with an option to displace the various bits around. Be careful with bits number five, six, and seven, which can result in total chaos. So it's a good thing they put the limiter here. And you can uh, also turn zeros into one or force it to be only zero. Too much control for my taste, but why not? Well, we have a built-in distortion that offers four types of distortion, starting from even harmonic drive to a fallback by half that falls a peak into themselves, into the wave. A rectifier, which turns your signal into a rectangular, adding odd harmonics, and a diode that adds both the even and odd harmonics, enriching the sound. And you have a filter section and an equalizer section, so out of the box you have a lot of controls, as well as, of course, general effects that can send this pad to the general delay and general reverb. And if we want to control these, we just come here. Very intuitive. I have to say that after a couple of days of playing with it, it feels very natural. Everything is well organized and you can also hot swap samples, meaning that if I choose this kick here, let's turn off the effects. I can hot swap it with every sample I want by just clicking it here. I will choose hot swap layer. Click a layer, and immediately it changes here. No need to double click or anything, which is very nice. And if I choose this one, it will swap all of the layers. You see, there are no layers around. Only a single layer based on what I've chosen here. Let's move to the important part, which is the drum pattern, which complements this drum machine. If I double click here, notice that I can get an event now by double clicking even outside of the locators, which was impossible in earlier versions of Cubase. It always adds one bar, regardless if you're with snap or without snap, that's very comfortable. And I can choose if I want to add a pattern event or a MIDI part from here. And of course I can also combine them in one track. I can have a MIDI part followed by a drum event. Both of them contains MIDI. I can even turn a drum event into a MIDI part, but not vice versa because MIDI parts contains more data than a drum event can contain. So let's add a drum event and double click it to see what we're getting. And we're getting a drum sequencer. Let me put it in the lower third of the screen, which from version to version becomes more packed and more meaningful, right? Now we have the drum machine here as well. So let's move to the editor and um, build a beat. You know, instead of just clicking around, which is also, of course, possible, this is what drum sequencers do. Let's use the more advanced functions. Add each fourth beat. And let's take the snare. Add each fourth beat as well for the snare. Oh, let's turn off this button here. It drives me crazy in the drum machine. Don't follow the pad. Okay, snare. Let's do this. Let's take the Euclidean and tell him to take all of this 16 length of pattern and divide it by two. See? Let's displace or nudge these two to the correct place. The Euclidean approach is very nice. We can take the hi-hats and create something interesting like take this pattern length and divide it by 10. or by nine, or by eight. You see? 
I'm not sure I would have come up with this any other way. No, this is too easy for my taste. Let's take this. I had. So all the basic functions you would expect, along with some very innovative things like randomization that takes into account the sort of material you're working with. So if it's a hi-hat, I will choose the hi-hat option and let it randomize the lane of hi-hats. If it was a kick, it will add kick patterns. And if I will choose um, open hi-hat, it will add less notes to the grid which makes sense. So it's a smart randomization algorithm, which comes on the layer level or the pattern level, and I won't hit this one right now because it will ruin my beautiful pattern. But it works. Maybe we'll do this. Let's add another pattern and then randomize the pattern. So, you see? And add another one here. And tell him to play pattern number two. It sounds like this. Less randomization, please. Right now I'm on the musical randomization. I have hybrid randomization, which is somewhere in between. Free randomization and musical randomization. The full randomization might sound a bit too chaotic at times, but of course it will always stay in the rhythm. Let's go back to musical. Have less. And let's go back to pattern number one. And of course, again, I can convert them, you see, to regular MIDI parts. So, what else have we got here? Here's one that really blowed my mind. It's the polyrhythmic option that this drum machine offers. First, I don't have to have each and every one of the lanes in the same length. Let's add more. Which creates very interesting inner circles. But notice this. If I choose here, adapt to pattern, now I have the actual nine parts played on the 16. Which is very, very interesting. Let's take the very popular five. This is an amazing function. And let's go back to straight 16s, keep it simple for now, and talk about the velocity, the obvious velocity lane, and maybe the less obvious repeats, which adds a buzz effect. Oh, this is so nice and so easily achieved. I can offset individual hits in milliseconds, up to 30 or minus 30 milliseconds. If I want things to be a little bit more push forward or laid back. Here's a huge one, probability. If I put it on 50%, some of them will not always play. It randomizes the play probability, as the name suggests. And I can do the same thing for the velocity as well, randomize the velocity. So this pattern always refreshes itself. And here's the beautiful thing. This feature also works within the MIDI domain. So in the key editor itself, you can do the same thing. I can, you know, draw a couple of notes here and design in the lower lane what's their play probability. You see? Or what's their velocity variance. I can randomize their velocity as well. Very, very flexible, adds a lot of functionality to the key editor and maybe reduces the needs to use various MIDI inserts, you know, and the MIDI modifiers or whatever. That's a beautiful supplement. And if I'm here, then we also have a node off velocity. If you care about that one, I have yet to encounter an instrument that really uses this function, but you know, instead of having it only in the info lane, we now have it as a lane here which might be useful for some of you, I don't know. If you ever use this function, please let me know in the comments because I haven't encountered one instrument that make any use of this feature. So, a very welcome addition to Cubase indeed, adds a lot of power and musicality. Now, here's one of the most exciting features ever. Imagine a world in which you can modulate everything you see. 
ta-da, enters modulators, also in the lower third, which packs LFOs, envelope shapers, shapers, macro controls, step sequencers, and even JavaScripts, which you can program yourselves. So let's say I want to modulate the volume. Please LFO the volume. Thank you. Now LFO the panning. Then LFO the EQ and another aspect of the EQ. And let's add another page. It's, it's endless. I haven't noticed any limitation here. Now, the sort of manual we got before the release said that there are eight modulators per track. These are not global. These are per track. And each one of them offers eight slots, but I haven't noticed that it's really limited to eight destinations. So move this one as well, and let's move this one. So now I'm at eight, but I can move forward. It keeps on opening more pages and more pages of destinations. So this is really amazing and packs a lot of power because now Cubase feels like a modulus software. Let's remove this modulator. So we have an LFO with all the basic controls you might expect. And we have, let's keep it open. In slot number two, I'll put an envelope follower, which creates an envelope, which any parameter can follow. Let's replace this one with a macro knob, which you can also give to certain destination and have it running around, maybe in different polarities. Let's say I want the panning to move to this side when I move this knob up. You see, they move in totally different directions. So this, this is amazing, the amount of control. And this is really spice up what Cubis can do. What else have we got here? We got the mod scripter, which you can write script. If you understand JavaScript, you have a JavaScript editor along with sort of a tutorial here. And it comes with built-in scripts that you can explore not too many but it's a good starting point so you can see why i got really excited about this one i am not able to even cover the potential of this thing in this video but i think it speaks for itself and let's see that i haven't missed any module yeah yeah and of course the step sequencer which also had a snap a uh, function built in so you can hit precise notes and precise values you can change the grid and so on and so forth. That's a huge, huge thing for Cubase. So thumbs up about this one, Steinberg. Another great feature is the new volume envelopes for the audio events. We can do this and that and this and have Bayesian curves in between, like in the automation uh, feature. But it used to work totally different in Cubase 13, right? It's like this, you can add points, but no curves in between. And you can click everywhere you want to add these points. And I've noticed that in Cubase 14, you have to click the line itself in order to add more breakpoints, which I think keeps it more safe from random accidental changes. But here's an interesting part. Between each two points, beside the node with the tension and the Bayesian curves, we've got this. I don't know if you can see it. This diamond here. And if I drag it up and down, it aligns the curve upwards and downwards like this. And I've got it here. You see, it simply appears between each two points. Very nice touch. And if I come back here, here's one of my favorite. And it works with the range selection tool. The range selection tool allows me now to select a range and immediately do this. That is very useful. Let me turn off the snap. I can just select the range here and immediately lower the volume. No such thing in Cubase 13. Nada. So I really like this feature. And also in the manual, they claim that even if you draw abrupt curves like I've done here, it will automatically smooth that transition internally. Here's the original curve but the resulting wave will look like this. So it's another nice touch to give you a more polished sound, even if you draw abrupt curves. 
Speaking of the range selection tool, it comes with many new features. So let me just erase the volume curve and let's duplicate the wave several times. Notice that if I select a range, first thing, the graphic is inverted and it makes it much more readable. Whereas in Cubase 13, it just looks like this. This is much more legible. And if I select a range and then delete it, the range selection stays, whereas in Cubase 13, it disappears. And in Cubase 14, if I want to reselect the range, not from the outer edges, I can simply push Shift and select a new range, whereas in Cubase 13, if you select a range and click in the middle, it disappears. So it's another nice touch. Also, double click in between two parts. Select the range in between. And if I switch the channel, you can set it up in the preference and the range selection will follow. So a couple of new neat tricks for the range selection tool. Mixing wise, if we take the mix console in the lower third, we can now open it up to its full potential. All right, let me remind you that in Cubase 13, you only had one aspect visible at a time. Now we can have as much as we want, which is very useful because I always like to see the volume faders, inserts and sends. These are the three things that are the most important for me most of the time. And now I don't have to open the independent mix console just to see that. And while we're at it, you can now drag and drop channels within the mixer itself. You don't have to do that in the track list. Of course, it affects the track list. You can also do it from the visibility list. I can drag channels now and reorder them to my liking from here. Speaking about mixing, the control room also got a facelift, much more slicker. Whereas in Cubase 13, it used to look a little bit cumbersome with this SSL knob here. So overall, it's more unified with the general look and feel of Cubase. Moving onward, we got a couple of new plugins to play with. One of them being the new Shimmer Reverb, which aims to be more of a, the internal special effect kind of reverb. So maybe drums will be less suitable for this example, but it comes with a built-in pitch shift. Let me demonstrate it with my mic. Yeah, you can go wild with this one when it comes to sound design. This is something previously Cubase didn't have. It has a sort of, you know, your usual bread and butter reverbs. And now this, a special effect reverb. Why not? Another interesting plugin is Studio Delay, which by the way, that goes for all the new plugin, is fully resizable, which is gorgeous. You can do this. So that looks like a multi-tap delay. Haven't played with it yet, but it looks good and it sounds quite decent. We've got a new auto filter. Up till now, we only had an auto pan. So why not have an auto filter? You can select band pass, low pass, high pass. We have a very unexcited volume module, which was basically built to complement the new modulators. Imagine that you have to change the volume between two plugins. Well, now you can. We have the underwater steep filter, which gives you the effect of being in the next room, which you can use to make those filter sweeps. Nice one. And that's about it for the new plugins. Now they have made some improvement to supervision, which is probably one of the most versatile visualizers out there. And now we have new color schemes to make it even more pleasing to the eye. So let's take the face scope and this is how it usually looked. Now, if you go into the settings, you can select new color scheme to fit your mood and the visual to your liking. So that's about it for the new plugins.
One of the greatest improvements to Cubase 14 is undoubtedly the new score editor, which features Dorico algorithms. And if I may quote Steinberg themselves, Cubase 14 marks the beginning of a new era in integrating our leading DAW with our notation software. We are committed to extending the functionality of the new score editor in developing additional features to further integrate Cubase and Dorico in future updates. So the future looks bright. And for anyone like me who doesn't really need a separate notation software, but occasionally does some scoring, this is amazing because the old, now we can say the old, um, scoring in Cubase was kind of a pain. And watch this, I'm gonna record something very simple here, and I'm gonna deliberately mix triolas with straight notes only to see how he handles it out of the box. Let's do it. This never happened. Control R. Nice. Amazing interpretation. This is amazing. Look at the overall UI of this thing. This is like a completely new software. Now, it wasn't meant to replace Dorico, but it will certainly bridge the gap. And you can now also export the notation, of course from Cubase to Dorico. The default algorithm seems to be doing such a great job. So let's take exactly the same part, only for comparison, and drag it into Cubase 13 and see how it looks there. Erase this. Exactly the same MIDI part. And let's push Control R. And you see this inferior in comparison to what we have now. You have to work a lot on this score to make it legible. Where is in Cubase 14? You just push Control R and see the wonders of this built-in algorithm. So this is great news, and this seems to be heading in the right direction with the development of the score editor, which was always a strong point of this DAW, but yet cumbersome to use. And now we seem to be in a whole new ballpark. In the collaboration section of this update, we now have full DAW project file format support, which means that Cubase can export its own project into other DAWs. Currently, they are only supported by Studio One and Bitwig, this file format, but expect this support to be expanded in the future. And the features supported by this format are quite extensive. Um, you can transfer projects that will include global tempo and time signatures, audio and video tracks, including the clips, instrument tracks, including clips, group and effects and output channels, marker and folder tracks, time signatures and tempo tracks, mixer routing, VST3 plugin settings. So quite an impressive format already. Um, but according to Steinberg, we can expect more features to be supported in the future. To wrap up this video, I will go through all sorts of miscellaneous parts of this update, which stood up to me because there are so many details here, so I just picked those who looked more important. One of them being optimized memory allocation, which basically means that now Cubase can handle multiple file tasks more efficiently, um, like closing a project or opening a project. This happens much faster and moving around a bunch of files at the same time also seem to be more smooth. We always want better functionality and more stability. So these sorts of improvements are at the end of the day, some of the most important ones. We also have several improvements to Dolby Atmos rendering and authoring in support for fourth order ambisonics. The bound selection, finally have a new option. Please don't ask again. The VST2 plugin support was disabled by default. If you want to re-enable it, you can. I think it's safe to say that we can say goodbye to VST2 plugin format by now. There's a bunch of new additions to spectral layers, but the one that stood up to me is the GPU accelerated support. There's a bunch of new key commands I'm not going to go through because there are tons of them. A new audio performance monitor extended view. Now that's a nice one. You can see here in this image that not only 
you can see your audio dropout. You can also see the plugin involved in this dropout and this can help you pinpoint the problem and move you towards the solution. There's an updated MIDI 2 functionality. Project files now can be larger than two gigabytes, which could be an issue for those of us who work with the ARA format. These files tend to be much larger. So now the default file format for Cubase project is 64 bit, which again, allows you to go beyond the two gigabyte limitation. Now that's also a nice one. We have a dedicated autosave subfolder for all of the back files and these got a new automatic naming schemes. So by default, every 15 minutes that you don't save the project, you just create a backup file and put it in the designated folder with a naming scheme that marks the last command. That's a nice one. The rule track now have a time offset, which basically means that if I create a ruler track, I can put a bar offset that is separate from the main timeline. You see now this one has spare of 21 bars until it reaches zero in bar 21. So it's a 21 bars offset. This could be very useful for large projects. And I'm not sure if I've talked about it or not, but now in the status line, we also have the audio input section and the audio output section, which opens the corresponding menu, which makes it more accessible. Whew, that was quite an extensive list. There's so much things going on in this update that I really think it's one of the best I've seen from Steinberg. So let me know in the comments below which one of the features you find the most exciting and most useful for your workflow. I have my personal favorites, but it is indeed hard to choose. Thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Have a great day.